Philippians chapter number four. It's a wonderful chapter. There's so much preaching in this chapter. Uh, but I want to I get to a little thought. Maybe I'll get to a thought. We'll see. Uh, the Bible says in verse number one, Therefore, my, be- my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and beseech Sintich that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing, the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless those that are working with young people on the other side. I certainly pray for those young people, the peer pressure they're facing. Lord, uh, just uh, growing up and being in this world, Lord, they're faced with a lot of emotion, a lot of things. And God, I pray that you would help uh, our folks that are teaching them to be a blessing to them. I pray you'd hedge them young people in. And God, I pray that you'd use them all the days of their lives for the glory of the Lord. Now, Father, I pray you'd meet with us again. I pray you'd speak through the word of God. I pray you'd challenge us. I pray you'd stir us. I pray that, Father, you would revive us in these days. Uh, uh, Lord, once again, we pray that you'd put a hedge about us. And God, I pray you'd bind the powers of hell. I pray you'd speak to hearts now. You know the need of every heart. And I pray Jesus will be glorified in each and every one of our lives. And Father, we'll not fail to bless you and praise you for all that you do. Once again, please use this unworthy vessel, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to this text. What we read were eight verses slap full. But I want to bring out some things in these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the regard uh, in verse number one, look what the Apostle Paul says. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I mean, in that verse, it's very easy to see that Paul loved these people. Uh, they were dear to him. They were dearly beloved. They were his crown and his joy. Uh, uh, my dear friends, the Apostle Paul uh, Uh, Many times when he's writing these epistles, he's in prison. Uh, He's been uh, uh, misused and abused. Uh, A lot has gone wrong in his life. And as he's reflecting in his ministry, and he's reflecting where God's used him to plant churches, uh, he doesn't have to think too long. uh, And uh, the church at Philippi comes across his mind. He thinks about these dear folks. Uh, It lifts his spirit. Uh, He said, if there's anything I've done right in this world, it happened in Philippi. They're my crown. Uh, They're my joy. They are dearly beloved. He highly regarded uh, this local church. Listen, I'm a pastor. I'm going to just share something with you tonight. Sometimes people get on your nerves. I may remember Brother Larry McGuffey. Brother Larry used to say all the time, ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. Uh, and sometimes that's true. There are some people that will get on your nerves. There are some people that just whine all the time. They complain all the time. They don't see how good they, they've got it. They're not in a nursing home. They're not suffering. Uh, uh, they may be facing something, but we all face something every day. Uh, and there are just some people that absolutely drive you up the wall. Uh, it's only by the grace of God my head doesn't look like Brother Ray's. I still have a little fuzz on top. Uh, uh, but listen, uh, when people are getting on your nerves, when 
when things uh, are, are driving you slap crazy, when you, you just don't know uh, uh, if you can do it anymore, all of a sudden you get to thinking about those that are faithful, those that do love God, those that uh, 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 exemplify the Lord in your life, and all of a sudden you get to thinking about that crowd uh, and the crowd that drives you crazy, which is usually just a very minute uh, 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 amount of people when you're uh, looking at a whole congregation, but a little leaven leavens a whole lump, and if you're not careful, uh, you'll focus on the little uh, that's driving you crazy instead of all the ones that are doing something for God. Uh, all you got to do is think about those that love God, love coming to church, love serving God, uh, and it will lift your spirit and it'll change your attitude. Paul right. is regarding these folks at Philippi. We see the regard. Notice the rift in verse number 2. Look what he says. I beseech Yodius and beseech Sintich, or however you say his name, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Uh, there's something between these two right here. I don't know what it is, but they're not seeing eye to eye on something. We preach this morning on togetherness. These two guys are not together. The Apostle Paul said, I beseech you, I'm begging you, I'm imploring you, uh, that you two have the same mind. Whatever it is, get over it. Whatever it is, get on the same page. Uh, whatever it is, it's not more important than the work of Christ. Uh, it's time to put this thing to bed. It's time to get over this rift. These two had a rift. And listen, it's only by the grace of God you're not in a rift with somebody. Hmm? Amen. But these two had a problem. We see the rift, and Paul is calling them out. How would you like to get a letter from the great apostle? the one who preached and, and established the church, you probably got saved under him, and uh, uh, the Lord has moved him on. Now he's in prison. You're praying for him. You're, you're thinking about the apostle and all that. And uh, several years went by, and now uh, 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 you get a letter. Now keep in mind, these folks didn't have a Bible like we got. Uh, they had to go on what they remembered what the apostle preached to them or what other preachers have come through and preached to them. All of a sudden they get a letter. They're going to, they make an announcement. Uh, uh, this week at church, we're going to read. We've got a brand new letter from the apostle himself. And boy, wouldn't you be excited? They were excited. Man, they were excited. This is homecoming. This is exciting stuff. And all of a sudden they get down about chapter 4 down there and all of a sudden he calls you out. You know what, today we assemble and sometimes the Holy Ghost will call you out. Amen. Amen. Nobody else may hear your name, but you hear your name. Yes. Mm -mm. When that letter was read for the first time, everybody heard their name. I wonder if they got the rift fix. Probably did after that. Mm? We see the regard, we see the rift. Now notice his request. Look at verse number 3. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. The Apostle Paul is remembering those who helped him. No doubt those women probably fixed him meals. Those women might have taken his uh, clothes down to the creek and uh, washed his clothes for him. Uh, those women might have provided an extra room at their house for him to stay. Uh, those fellow yoke labor, the same thing. Uh, they took care of him. They helped minister unto him. They made certain he was comfortable. Uh, made certain that there was uh, no obstacles from him being the minister, the man of God. Uh, and here Paul is remembering them uh, and the church has grown and the church is uh, in a position to be able to do something and he's giving them a request he's saying take care of those folks uh, they were good to me be good to them uh, honor them be a blessing to them uh, uh, they're important in my heart and in my life Paul didn't forget where he came from what a blessing I've seen some preachers um, the Lord use them Lord blesses them then all of a sudden they climb up the ladder and they forget those churches that help them get there I'm thinking of one right now. We used to have them all the time. You support them. You used to have them all the time. You used to try to be good to them, be a blessing to them. Uh, all of a sudden, he got a church and started uh, uh, flourishing. He forgot all about us. Until oh his health went bad. Then the letters started coming again. Hmm? Say, Brother Doug, did we help him? No. Say, why? Because I'm a redneck. We weren't good enough for you when you got to be high and mighty, and now that all of a sudden you've been lowered a little bit, now you want us again. No, 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 Bob and I, we're going to give somebody that appreciate it. 
Huh? Uh, the Apostle Paul never forgot where he came from and never forgot who God used to be a blessing to him Amen. in his life. Uh, we see the request. Now notice the rejoicing. We know this verse. A lot of people sing this verse in a song. Verse number four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How many are guilty of that verse? I didn't think so. We don't always rejoice, do we? Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Can I say in, in 1 Thessalonica, we find that the, the Apostle Paul lets us know in everything we're to give thanks. That means good days and bad days, we need to thank the Lord. Amen. And can I say, uh, whether we're on the mountaintop or whether we're in the valley, we ought to rejoice. Why? Because we're saved. Because we're headed to heaven. Because the Lord's been good to us. The Lord's met every need. The Lord has uh, uh, certainly been kind to us. He's been merciful to us. Uh, he's been long-suffering with us. Uh, we do have cause to rejoice. Uh, you know why we don't rejoice? We're either looking inward or looking around. Amen. If we ever get to where we're looking at Him, we'll rejoice. Right. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, Brother Ron, some of us have forgotten what gutter God found us in. Hmm? Well, we forgot what it was like to be lost. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But some of us have been saved so long, we've just taken for granted being saved. Mm -hmm. Paul reminds us we're to rejoice always. And it's so important, he said, and again, I say rejoice. Amen. Aren't you glad God tells us again yeah. and again yeah. and again yeah. and again? You say, why do we got to have preaching all the time? Because we need to hear it again right. and again yeah. and again. Yeah. I believe Marcy sings a song uh, I heard when I was a, a teenager. That's when she started singing it, when I was a teenager, and she was about 60 then. Uh, remember, Lord, I'm human, and humans are apt to forget. Hmm? And we do forget. That's why it's a blessing to have a Bible that never changes. We can go back to it always says the same thing. And then notice, if you will, Paul dealing with our reputation. Look at verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. That's kind of what Miss Marcy sang about a minute ago. They ought to see our moderation, our modesty, our motives. They ought to see all of that in our life. They ought to see something different in us. And the reason we ought to live for Christ today because His return's at hand. Yeah. We don't know when he's coming, but we do, do know he's coming, and he could come today, and I certainly want to be where I should be when he comes. Yes, and then notice, by the way, your reputation isn't what you think of yourself. Your reputation is what other people see in you and tell others about you. Hmm? And then notice, if you will, the restlessness. Look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing... But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That phrase, be careful for nothing, Paul is not saying don't be safe or don't be cautious or don't be precise. He is saying don't be wormy or don't be anxious. He's saying be careful for nothing when you approach the Lord. When you come to Him, let everything be known in prayer with, in thanksgiving unto God. Let your requests be made known unto God. Don't be wormy. Hmm? Uh, my darling daughter's here, and I am blessed. The four women in my life are all beautiful. And uh, my daughter here knows that if she needs anything, all she got to do is ask. She don't have to come in the back door and walk in backwards saying, Daddy... If you can find it in your heart, all you got to do is ask. Matter of fact, all my kids, they already have everything I got. All they got to do is let me know if they need something. Hmm? Uh, El Rose got a Christmas present today. <laughs> Mimi said it was for Christmas. I said it wasn't. She come in. I let her see it. She got all excited, cut running. I say, say, Rev. She says, Rev. She got it. <laughs> huh? I'm just saying, the Lord says, don't be wormy. Don't be. And Paul's saying, be careful. Don't be anxious. Amen. You know when people are anxious when they come to church or when they're anxious when they talk to God? 
when their heart's not settled. Mm -mm. Can I say, anxiety is a real issue, but we're never to have anxiety with the Lord. We ought to be where we're supposed to be. Can I say, anxiety and prayer are as mutually opposed as fire and water. How in the world can you have faith about talking to God and asking for something if you have anxiety about talking to God? So if you are facing anxiety, the best way to do is talk to God and say, Lord, help me with this because I need to talk to you about something. And he'll calm you and then talk to him. But be careful for nothing. And he deals with restlessness. Then he deals with reassurance in verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank the Lord for the peace of God. Amen. Now let me help you something. You're not going to have the peace of God when you're out of the will of God. Amen. Now if you're saved, you have peace with God. But that don't mean you have the peace of God. You've got to be where God wants you to be to have the peace of God. And if you are not where you're supposed to be, then you will not be, you will be careful for nothing, and then you will uh, not have peace with God. But if you're where you're supposed to be, you'll have peace with God. Amen. And can I say that's something money cannot buy? Amen. That's something that at some point in your life you're going to need. You're going to need the peace of God in your life. You're going to face things in this old wicked world. Not everything's going to go your way. Joe Olstein's a liar. Not every day is going to be a Friday. I read over there in Job, there came a day. And when that day came, Job lost everything he had. He lost his family, he lost his flocks, he lost his finances, he lost it all. And Job still went and worshipped the Lord. Can I say, the Lord's never required that of you, but there will come a day. And not, it's not all going to go your way. And can I say, you need to have the peace of God in your heart. He had the peace of God. He deals with reassurance. I'm thankful that no matter what I face, deep down inside, there's a calm. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but when Miss Annette a few years ago told me I had cancer, that wasn't a good day. I didn't wake up that day signing up for cancer. But can I say, it did not shake my foundation because I know in whom I believed in. And persuaded he's able to keep that you know, against the, that day. I'm confident in the Lord. And you can ask her after service. She'll tell you, I told her. Didn't catch God by surprise. It'd be all right. And here we are. We're still at it. And so I say, blessed be the name of the Lord. But I want you to see the root of everything he is saying in these verses. You find it verse number 8. He says, finally, here's the root. This is what he wanted them to see. Finally brethren. Now again, he's talking to save people. He's talking to the brethren. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. How many of you heard me say a million times the battle's in our mind? Yeah. Amen. I have lived in this verse. This verse will help you. Hmm? Listen, the devil wants to make our minds scrambled eggs. He wants our minds on everything that isn't pure, everything that isn't lovely, everything that isn't just, everything that isn't of a good report. Uh, uh, why does Paul tell us to think on these things? Uh, these things will calm us. Uh, these things will help us. Uh, these things will cause us to continue uh, in this way called straight. Uh, these things will help our reputation. These things uh, will be an anchor to our soul uh, if we establish our, the right kind of thinking. Can I say? We're to transform and renew our minds. How do we do that? By that verse right there. If you're not careful, you'll be thinking about all kinds of junk. You can be sitting in church and your mind's out there somewhere. Some of you already checked out and you're putting your Bengals gear on in your mind. Uh, uh, that's sad. If you'd rather, rather talk about Bengals than the Lord. Uh, uh, 
That's a sad, sad thing. I'm telling you, verse number 8 is the root of what will help us. And I want to help God's people tonight. I'm interested what it says. He says, whatsoever things are true. So don't think about false things. Huh? You ever watch any of these ads for politicians? They make up stuff. They're all lies. Don't, watch, don't listen to all that junk. That's going to get you all jacked up. Think about things that are true. Hmm? Amen. Things that God has told you. Yeah. Things that you've proven in your life to be true. Think about those things. Amen. Whatsoever things are honest. Think about honest things, not dishonest things. Uh, a lot of dishonest things in this world. Don't think about that. Think about honest things. Uh, whatsoever things are just. Think about things that are right. A lot of injustice going on in our world. Don't think about all that stuff. It'll get you all messed up. Uh, whatsoever things are pure. Uh-oh. Hey, things that are, you know, they're unsinful. They're not sinful. They're not wicked. They're not ungodly. Uh, 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 things that are pure. Things that are well, uh, of good report. Things that uh, honor the Lord. Things that will help your life. Uh, listen, you know one of the worst things you can do, mamas and daddies? Subject your, your kids at a young age to some of the wicked things in this world. Right. Hmm? Letting them get all involved in them vampire series. There ain't nothing good in that stuff. That's wicked. Huh? Let them get involved in something that's pure. Something that will help them. Something that will encourage them. Something that won't cause them to have nightmares. Some of you all messed up because you looked at that stuff when you was younger. Huh? Listen, if it goes in your eyes, it's going to go in your mind. It goes in your mind, and it long, you know, takes long, doesn't take long. It's going to end up in your heart, and it's going to cause you all kinds of problems. Hmm? You ought to protect your minds. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely, not wicked, not heinous. Uh, whatsoever things are good, of good report. Uh, he says, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Things that are a virtue and things that are worth praising God over. That's what you need to think about. That'll help you. And I got to reading this, got to thinking about this, and I want to capitalize on what he said there in verse number 8. If there be any virtue, I want to preach for just a few minutes on virtuous thinking. Virtuous thinking because it'll help you. Because you live in a world that combats virtuous thinking. You live in a world that wants your thinking to be worldly. And if you think worldly, guess what you're going to act? Worldly. You're not going to have the peace of God. You're not going to have the strength you need. You're not going to have the help you need. You're going to be messed up. And there's a lot of people sitting in churches that are messed up. And it's not because the preacher don't preach. It's not because the Bible's not true. It's not because these things don't work. It's because you don't apply them. You've got your thinking all messed up. And so I want to give you some things on virtuous thinking. Now, the definition of virtue, quite simply, is good moral character. Good moral character. Amen. Most of you, if you work a job, you work around people that do not have good moral character. Amen. Hmm? If you turn on a television, you're going to see TV shows about people that do not have good moral character. If you turn on the radio, you're going to hear things from people who do not have good moral character. So we are constantly inundated with things that are not of good moral character. Good moral character will help your life. Good moral character will develop convictions in your life. Convictions are things that you uh, in, in, have in your life that puts guardrails about your life that keeps you from going different directions. Problem with some people, they're off the rails. Amen. They have no constraints in their life, so therefore their life's a mess. They have no victory. They have no joy. They have no peace. They have no gentleness, no goodness. The fruits of the Spirit are not incorporated in their life because they are not living a life of good moral character. That's the definition of virtue. But the biblical definition of virtue is this. A sincere love for God that creates a desire for His holiness. You know, it's been over a hundred years since there's been nationwide preaching on holiness. Matter of fact, can I say this? You're hard-pressed to find a book dedicated 
that has been written on living a life of holiness? Most of the books written today, I'm talking about Christian books, are glorified humanistic books. They're trying to teach you to have a better life. Well, I've got a great book that will help you have a better life. It's right here. And if you uh, incorporate chapter 4, the book of Philippians, in your life, you'll have a better life. Hmm? But can I say that you'll never have the peace and never have your mind sane like God desires for it to be until you let virtue be incorporated in your life, a sincere love for God that creates a desire for His holiness. Uh, if I did a poll tonight, I'd ask you if you love God. Everybody put your hands up. You love God. Uh, obviously, you're in church tonight. There's something uh, that has been incorporated in your life where you appreciate the goodness of God. Uh, uh, but can I say a sincere love for God uh, means that I love Him supremely. I love Him more uh, than anything or anyone else in this world. Uh, and I'm going to put God first uh, in hopes that I'm going to be transformed into His likeness. Uh, they were first called Christians because their lives emulated the Lord Jesus. Uh, we know the Lord Jesus was without sin. Uh, he obviously was holy. Uh, uh, the crowd that came behind him uh, 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 that desired uh, there in Antioch to be like Christ, uh, they looked so much like Christ and sounded so much like Christ. Uh, obviously, they weren't holy in their flesh. Uh, obviously, they weren't sinless. Uh, but their lives so emulated the Lord that everybody around them called them Christians. Uh, we adopt that name, but very few live up to it. Amen. That's because we do not desire God so much that we desire to be like Him. You know what to bring revival? Having a sincere love for God and a desire for His holiness to be engrafted into us. And when we think virtuously, those things will start to happen. Let me give you a few things about what virtue brings. Can I say virtue brings power? Brings the power of God. Can I say there are very few folks walking around today that's got the power of God on their life. There's very few people around today that know how to pray the power of God down from heaven. Uh, there's very few people today that can stand and preach and the power of God falls upon the crowd. Uh, 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 what is uh, uh, the problem, preacher? We don't think virtuously. Uh, 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 we think about all kinds of other junk uh, and we come to God, the house of God and expect God to bless it. Uh, uh, it would be a sure uh, better service if we all brought God with us because uh, we had been walking with Him uh, because uh, we had desired him because his love was bouncing off of us and our minds uh, uh, were thinking about the pure things, the honest things, the just things, the things of good report uh, and when we come in the house of God uh, we weren't praying for God to show up, we was expecting him to show up because uh, we brought him with us, uh, God help us uh, where's the power of God uh, I remember them old timers they didn't have a bunch of degrees behind their name, uh, uh, they didn't even understand uh, a lot of things about the Bible or even could pronounce a lot of the words in the Bible uh, but they did know how to pray uh, they did know how to seek after God uh, and hey uh, heaven would move towards earth uh, my dear friends uh, we need those days again uh, where we didn't trust in our abilities and our intellect and our talents uh, but we trusted in almighty God again and the power of God would fall uh, the indictment of our day we don't have much virtue. We got folks outside the church. Uh, everything they run through, through the world, they let run through their mind. In so much that if you think on it long enough, you'll accept it. The Bible says, whatsoever a man thinketh, so is he. Hmm? Amen. Brother Tommy... If you think long enough that it's okay for you to be a Christian and live however you want to, you'll convince yourself that's okay. Hmm. That's why I can preach and I can preach and I can preach and I can preach and then I can preach on what I preached on, on being faithful. I can preach it on Sunday morning until the cows come home, but there are some people not going to be faithful. They're going to give you Sunday morning only and expect you to be pleased with that. Well, here's the problem. It's not up to me. Are they pleasing the Lord? 
and they may come in with a smile and they may come in and act like everything's all right, but I sure wouldn't, I sure wouldn't want to be a fly at the wall at their house because I guarantee you they're troubled. Because somebody's right. got that kind of thinking, they don't have the touch of God on their life like they should. Right. Hmm? Amen. Huh? Amen. Listen, God knows when you're sick, God knows when you're providentially hindered, but God also knows when you're not putting Him first. Right. Amen. Hmm? And there's some people, their thinking's all messed up. There are people that think that, uh, well, you know, uh, the world says it's okay. It must be okay. Brother Ron, I don't know if you ever had this when you pastored. Brother Adrian, I don't know if you ever had this pastor when you pastored. But did you ever have somebody ask you a question? And you know they weren't really wanting the Bible answer. They was wanting to see how close they could get to the world and still be okay. Hmm? Hmm? You know why? Their thinking was all messed up. There are people that convince themselves it's okay to do things that, you know out there in the world as long as it don't affect anybody else. What well, does affect everybody else? Amen. Amen. It affects you and those around you because you're a written epistle known and read of all men. That's right. uh, I'm telling you, virtuous thinking is vastly important because virtue is where the power comes from. Can I say this? Virtue brings purity. Can I say the Lord said, Be ye holy, for I'm holy. Right. We may never ever become holy, and in his flesh we won't, but we ought to strive for it. Yeah. We, stri we ought to strive to be as pure as we can before the Lord. How many of you know that when you're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit? Amen. You know the Holy Spirit lives in you. Right. So everything you look at, He looks at. Everything you listen to, he listens to. Everywhere you go, you take him. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the Holy Ghost is pleased with us. Mm -hmm. See, virtue brings power, but it also brings purity. Our lives ought to be clean before the Lord. Mm -hmm. hmm? By the way, our lives ought to be clean before men. Right. Amen. Yeah. Nobody ought to be able to put a finger on anything in your life and say that I don't think a Christian would do that. And by the way, our bodies ought to be clean too. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, don't come to church stinking. People are going to be sitting around you. Mm -hmm. hmm? Take a shower. <coughs> Wash your hair. Brush your teeth. Huh? If you can't afford toothpaste, you can't afford uh, soap, let me know. We'll get you some. If you can't afford water, we'll pay your water bill. But please do not come and stink. Huh? Uh, that's pretty bad, Brother Bob, and i got to go, how you doing? <laughs> Got to see you. Then you walk out and got to go scrub my hands. Hmm? Amen. Uh, we ought to inherently have something in us that say we ought to take care of ourselves, have enough pride to take care of our bodies. Yeah. Right. But as a Christian, we ought to inherently have something from the Spirit of God that desire, creates a desire that we ought to be clean before the Lord. Right. Do you know the Bible says we're all naked before the Lord? You know what that means? That means you, can, you can't put lipstick on a pig. You can dress up this flesh however you want to, but the Lord really sees what's going on. Amen. Virtue brings purity. It'll cause us to be clean. It'll cause us to be chaste. What does that mean? That means I'm not going to cheat on the Lord. Amen. Hmm? It'll develop character in us. Some real character. There are people got the mindset. Well, you can't live a Christian life, so live however you want to, and God will forgive you. That's not biblical. Amen. And by the way, if your mindset is, I'm going to do this anyway, and then God will forgive me, He won't forgive you. Right. Hmm? Right. Matter of fact, He says there's works meet for repentance. He says that there'll be some contrition in your life to where you really feel guilty from the way you acted, uh, and when you repent, you have a desire to never go back to that, uh, and you turn to Him. Hmm? This little, now I lay me down to sleep, forgive me, Lord, stuff don't really work. That's why we don't have the power of God in our churches. There are people that want to tell our young people, you know, I couldn't live a good life, so you can't live a good life either, so go out and live it up. That's wicked. Just because you failed God don't mean they have to fail God. Amen. By the way, not everybody lives wicked. God gave everybody will, and you got choices to make, 
and they've got choices to make. Uh, I'm going to point them in the direction to make the right choice. Uh, you may have not made the right choice. Thanks be unto God for the good grace of God uh, who did forgive you after you made the wrong choice. Uh, but hey, they don't have to go down that road. Uh, hey, these young people don't know don't need to know what alcohol tastes like. Uh, they don't need to know what drugs feel like in their body. Uh, they don't need to know what perverse uh, and, and sexual sins are. They don't need to know all that stuff. Uh, what they need to know is God is pure and they ought to live a pure life. Uh, and God will bless them for it. Uh, there are people who says, well, it's okay to watch porn if you want to watch porn. Just don't let it affect anybody else. You know, there's this problem with that. That's wicked. Uh, that's lusting after the flesh and lusting after the world and lusting after the things of the world, and that's sinful. Matter of fact, if the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, the pride of life is in you, the love of God's not in you. Amen. God help us. There are people who talk about all kinds of wicked things and try to justify them. Here's, the, here's your justification. It's wicked. It's sin. And if that's in your life, you need to get right with God. Amen. And don't promote that stuff to somebody else because you were too weak-minded because you didn't live in verse number 8. You allowed it to happen in your life. Amen. Huh? It's not normal. It's wicked. Hmm? What is normal? I don't know anymore. I used to know what a man and a woman was. Now we got Supreme Court justice don't know what a woman is. I don't know what's normal anymore. I know one thing, this world doesn't look very normal. Uh, seeing grandmas with purple hair and green hair, that's not normal. You know what we used to call that? A circus. It is amazing they've done away with uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus, and now we've got the circus in the streets. Bring back the big tent and the elephants, I say, huh? Lord have mercy, we're living in a weird world, huh? We're living in a world where mamas and, and, and daddies uh, uh, are repining the way they were raised and thought they missed out on something, so you've got mamas trying to relive their youth through their daughters. You got mamas wearing uh, uh, clothes that uh, wouldn't even cover their daughter, let alone themselves, huh? Amen. And they think it's okay. No, it's wicked. Right. Hmm? God help us. We're to live a modest life. We're to live a life that brings no attention to our flesh, but brings attention and praise unto Jesus. Amen. And if we live in that verse, we will. Amen. You see, virtue brings purity. Hmm? You know why I'm on target tonight? Don't see much purity anymore. Hmm? Huh? Matter of fact, they ought to quit selling white wedding dresses. Some of you know what I mean. Right. Hmm? Thank you, Brother Tommy. Huh? I always say that because he wore a white wedding dress to his wedding. But anyway. I'm only, I'm only teasing, but I have seen him in a tutu. So do you if you was at that Christmas program a couple years ago. Do you know how long, how long and hard it was to find a tutu to fit him? I'm talking about virtue tonight. I had to, I had to lift it. It's getting a little heavy right there. Some of you is about to pass out. I had to lift spirit a little, a little bit right there. But verse 8 will bring power in our lives. It will bring purity in our lives. Virtue brings the practice of obedience in our lives. Can I say the Christian life is the best life you can ever live? Amen. But it's the best life when it's not a forced life. If you have to force yourself to come to church, if you have to force yourself to read your Bible, if you have to force yourself to pray, if you have to force yourself to open a hymn book and sing. And by the way, Brother Clint, thanks. It's, a lot, it's very difficult to hold a song book and a Bible and sing in and wave the Bible. That's hard to do when, when you're not coordinated. Well, you know, but hey, uh, you, if you've got to force yourself to sing, if you've got to force yourself to pay your tithes, if you've got to force, 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 that's a miserable Christian life. No wonder you don't have any joy. No wonder you don't have any uh, praise for the Lord. You're forcing yourself. You know why you're forcing yourself? You're not living in verse 8. Mm. Amen. You live in verse number 8. You don't force. You get to can't help it. I can't, he I can't help it. I can't wait to get to church. Can't wait to pray. Can't wait to read my Bible see what God says. Can't wait to witness for God. Can't wait to do the things of God. Why? Because you're living a virtuous life. The virtue... And a virtuous life brings a practice of obedience. It never enters my mind not to come to church. Amen. 
That's just part of my life. Right. Right. Huh? I can't wait to show up, show up and see what God does next. Amen. Hmm? If I would have come tonight, Brother Clint wouldn't have scared me. <laughs> Who needs Halloween when you got Clint? <laughs> By the way, Halloween night be the anniversary of us coming in the church. I think this is, uh, uh, what is it, 20 years this year we've been in this building. We started our first service was on Halloween night. We had one on Halloween night. Anybody remember what I preached on that night? I preached on hell night. We just kind of getting used to the building. We was going to kick off on a Sunday, but we come in on, uh, on that, that, I believe it was a Friday night. And just have a special service, get used to the building. Because I tried to tell folks it's not going to sound the same, not going to feel the same. Your seat's not going to feel the same. So we had a service on Halloween night. Preached on hell night. A little trivia didn't cost anything. But I'm saying a virtuous life will bring about the practice of obedience. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Amen. What a privilege to get to do the thing. What a privilege to have a Bible. What a privilege to talk to God. What a privilege to be able to sing, have songs worth singing. What a privilege to be able to take part in the church. Uh, shame on us that we didn't have a testimony to brag on the Lord. You know, my blood pressure had been up all day today. I'd been fine not getting to preach. It'd been all right if some of you would have said so tonight. And I could have said, hallelujah, let's go to house. Uh, uh, but we needed to hear this message tonight because we're not thinking right not only brings the practice of obedience, but virtue brings poise. Another word for poise is balance. Our Christian life needs to have balance. You can't lean all the way to the left, you're a liberal. You're denying the faith. You can't lean all the way to the right, then you're a Pharisee. You leave no room for God to act. You need to have balance. You need to have the Word of God, and you need to have the Spirit of God directing. Uh, the psalmist said, My foot standeth in an even place. He had balance in his life. Uh, uh, can't be all this way or all that way. Uh, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, but we're still in the world. It's okay to enjoy something. It's okay to enjoy watching a football game. It's okay to enjoy uh, some of the pleasures of life. Uh, as long as those things don't overtake you and cause you to think wickedly and to do wickedly. Uh, but you got to have balance. You can't be all the time fun and games. Uh, you got to have some structure in your life. Uh, and hey, virtue's what brings balance. It brings poise in our life. So many people... They want to be told what to do. Well, the Bible will tell you. But see, you don't want to get in the Bible and let God tell you what to do. You want a preacher to get up and give you a list of rules to do. Well, the problem is you can do those rules. That ain't going to make you happy because you're not living in verse number 8. But if you live in verse number 8, God will tell you what to do. And your life will be so much more happy. Virtue brings poise. It brings balance. But it also brings prominence. Prominence. Causes your life to be relevant. Causes your life to have significance. So many people feel like that their life isn't doing anything for God. It's not making a difference for God. I'm just not making an impact for God. What, what, what good is my Christian life? I, I, I just don't do it good enough. What you're doing is you're telling on yourself you're not living in verse number 8. Verse number 8 will cause you to have some prominence. All of a sudden you realize your life is counting for Christ because you're doing exactly what Christ wants you to do. Amen. The problem is, is you're looking at somebody else's life and you're saying, I'm not that. Well, God may not want you to be that. God wants you to be you. Right. And He wants you to live in verse number 8 so that He can use you as you. And when you are living for God and you're in the center of God's will, nothing else matters. So many people are looking for significance and really what they're doing, Brother Bob, they want a pat on the back. They want to hear that they're doing okay. Well, the pat on the back comes when we get home. How we know we're doing okay is when we live in verse number 8 because then it doesn't matter what men say of us. What matters is what Jesus says of us. And he'll tell you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when you're living in verse number 8, because your thinking is right. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 5 says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, 
and virtue knowledge. Peter said, add to your faith. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We get faith by the scriptures. And Peter says, it's good you got faith, but add to your faith virtue. And then add to virtue knowledge. But see, we've got that all wrong in this day and age. We live in the age of information. So we've added to our faith knowledge. We've left out virtue. In our day and age, there's more people that know more about the Bible than any other generation before. But there's less God. Because there's not virtue. When all you do... When you add knowledge to, vert, uh, knowledge to faith, all you end up with is a Pharisee. You just have somebody who's knowledgeable and legal, but they have no virtue. They have no power. They have no, no poise. They have no purity. They have no, no practice of obedience, so therefore they're a Pharisee. He said, add to your faith virtue, and then your virtue knowledge said it would be better to have virtue than know everything about the Bible. And by the way, if you get virtue, you'll add to virtue knowledge. And then he went on to say and add to knowledge that dirty word, patience. I had to bring that out. It's not in my notes, but I had to bring it out because of a conversation I had before church. Yeah. You know who I'm talking about, don't you, Phil? Yeah. Phil told on himself. His darling little girl, his only darling little girl. The very person he ought to move heaven and earth for wants to go to Chick-fil-A, and he, walk, he drives by Chick-fil-A down there, and the line's, you know, forever. He said, no, I'm not waiting in that line. He said, I'll park and let you go in. He's still waiting. He's still in the truck. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to wait for that. And then, then he, he told himself yesterday, Sam's had gas for $2.80. He said, I went over there, was 400 people. I wasn't waiting for that. So he paid $20 for a gallon. I don't know what he did. What he was telling us, he didn't have any patience. So if you add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge, then you can add patience to that, Brother Phil. You need some patience in your old age. What else are you going to do anyway? You're retired anyway. What are you going to do? Wait line, get a Chick-fil-A sandwich. It's worth the wait, you know. I know the line's long. I hate to wait in it too, but I mean, it moves quick. Huh? You know, get your girl Chick-fil-A sandwich. Lord, have mercy, Brother Phil. Or do what my oldest son does. Door dash it. Have him bring it to you. I mean, you pay four times more for it, but you get it delivered to the house. You don't have to wait. Huh? We don't like being patient, do we? Probably because we don't have enough virtue. Now, don't pray for patience. I see what comes with patience, tribulation. Tribulation work of patience. And please don't pray for me to get patient. I've never had it, don't want it. Hmm? I, I believe patient is waiting two seconds before your horn cuss somebody, pulls out in front of you. That's patience. Well, huh? I said, what are you saying, preachers? I'm saying I don't have enough virtue when I'm driving. Mm. Uh. Listen. A lot of our issues will be solved. And I preached not long ago. Remember that message? Issues, issues, we all have issues. A lot of our issues will be solved if we'd learn the secret to verse number 8 of chapter number 4. If our thinking's right, our actions will be right. Our walk will be right. Our testimony will be right. Our spirit will be right. Our, our hope will be right. Everything will be right if our thinking's right. We have an enemy that does not fight fair. Amen. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And he devours us not with teeth, not being in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. He, de he devours us by putting little thoughts in our mind. And when we're not thinking virtuously, we start stewing on that thought and we think about it and we think about it before long that thought's got us kind of like a fish looking at a shiny thing in the, in the, in the river oh that's interesting hmm I'm going to get close to that and see well, oh that looks okay and before you know it it's got the fish and somebody's having the fish for dinner our lives will be better for Christ if we learn the secret to verse number 8 God help us
to learn to think virtuously. It would change our life. It would change our church. It would change people around us because they'll see Christ in us. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Maybe tonight you need some help with this. Say, Lord, help me to think right. Some of you need to this week just go back and revisit this verse every day. Amen. Say, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, with that verse. Help me in those areas where I fail, Lord. Help me. Help my thinking. Lord, help me to be more like you. Some of you need to come tonight and ask the Lord to help you. Some maybe need to come tonight and pray for somebody. Maybe you need to come pray for a revival. I don't know. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. They're picking our song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for those verses that make us rejoice. But thank you for this verse that makes us think. God, help our thinking to be virtuous thinking. Lord, help us to be studious of this verse. Help us to apply it to our hearts and lives. And God, use it to insulate our thinking and our minds. Lord, help us to draw nigh to God that you might draw nigh to us. Help us to resist the devil because he'll flee from us. Bless these in the altar. Speak to hearts. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.